Hey, I'm Christian Osterman. I uh, wasn't able to be here last time, but I direct the uh, European program and the History and Public Policy program here at the Wilson Center and on behalf of the Center and on behalf of uh, my co-chair, Roger Lewis, and the National History Center. I'd like to welcome all of you to the second uh, session of the spring semester of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs, featuring today uh, Dr. Trudy Haskam-Peterson um, with a presentation on unfinished business archives after conflict in Guatemala, Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone and South Africa. Uh, next week, just to uh, preview what's coming up, uh, we have the great privilege of uh, having with us uh, Professor Charlie Mayer, who is a newly arrived Wilson Center um, eminent scholar, or distinguished scholar, the first of its, uh, the first of its kind uh, here at the Wilson Center. So fresh that the Center hasn't, I think, completely figured out how the title of these um, of the new beast, but um, Charlie is it, and he will be talking next Monday about territory, statehood, and sovereignty from Westphalia to globalization. Uh, as always, four o'clock on Monday's fourth floor conference room. It's now my great pleasure to um, introduce very briefly, and then Roger will uh, conclude the introduction. Um, uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Trudy Haskin peterson who is a former uh, Wilson Center public policy scholar and one of this country's uh, leading archivists. Uh, she has served in a number of um, important positions in the archival profession uh, throughout her career. Uh, she has served as the president of Society of American Archivists, um, as well as president uh, of the International Conference of the Roundtable on Archives. Uh, she was the acting archivist of the United States from 1993 to 1995, the founding executive director of the Open Society Archives, the Soros Archives, um, director of the Archives and Records Program at the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Currently, she's an international consultant on archives um, usually when I try to reach her, she's off to some far-flung exotic country um, exploring, uh, restoring, um, recapturing their archives. She is the recipient of the Republic of France's Order of the Arts and Letters. And um, the, in 2007, the Academy of Certified Ac Archivists uh, presented uh, Trudy with its Distinguished Service Award. She has a host of publications to her credit. Let me just point out uh, this one. That's the Wilson Center one, Final Acts, a guide to preserving records of truth commissions, published by the Wilson Center as a result of uh, her stint here. And it is, in fact, on this subject that she will be uh, further talking about today. So welcome, Trudy, and let me turn it over to Roger for couple of remarks. Uh, just a word of welcome to Trudy on behalf of the National uh, History Center. Uh, we were a little reluctant to use the word certified to describe her <laughs> position, but after she certified that she is a certified archivist, uh, that explains uh, the reason for the, the title. Uh, Trudy lives a life of high adventure. Uh, if she's not in Sierra Leone, then she is in South Africa or Tanzania or Mongolia, other par parts of the world. Uh, she mentioned to me that she has six international trips coming up before the 1st of April. That's right. Uh, including places in the Middle East. And I asked her whether Cairo was on her agenda, and she said, not yet. Uh, if she does go to Cairo, I hope that uh, Cairo will be the subject of archival uh, investigation because it is really difficult to work in the archives uh, in uh, Cairo. My own experience is that after, uh, in other places throughout the world, once they become independent, they uh, almost immediately instigate a very authoritarian, arbitrary uh, admission to their uh, uh, archives. Uh, Hong Kong, for example, when Hong Kong was still a colony, uh, 
it was relatively easy to get access to the archives. Now that uh, conditions have changed, uh, all that you can say is good luck, uh, not only to people wanting access to uh, archives in Hong Kong, but throughout the world. I wonder whether before we hand it over to Trudy, whether we could just go around the room and get people to identify themselves. Jim? Jim Grossman, Executive Director of the American Historical Association. Was retired historian. Uh, Landis, Landis Jones, uh, professor of political science emeritus. Emily Willer, the National Security Archive. Carol Sang, retired historian. Brian, Brian Messerly, National History Center. Sonia Michelle, director of U.S. Studies here at the Wilson Center. David Nichols, Department of State. Isaac Sprick, American Historical Association. Bilal Siti Sudhir, also of the American Historical Association. Stephen Lipson, a student at Catholic, Catholic University. Ross Johnson, Wilson Center. Hmm. Charles Mayer, next week's speaker. As you. <laughs> Sorry, were you present? <clears throat> Don Wolfensberger with the Congress Project here at the Wilson Center. <laughs> uh, Paul Pittman, Department of State. Miriam House Cunningham, the National History Center. Anna Nelson, of American University. Tim McDonald from the Wilson Center. Gary Peterson, chauffeur. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Welcome, Gary. Um, let me just, before, before turning it over to, to Trudy, uh, I was remiss in not thinking um, Miriam Cunningham, uh, Assistant Director of the National History Center, and Tim McDonald, Assistant with my program for putting this uh, event in place, and also acknowledging the support of the Society of Historians of American Foreign Relations that makes uh, that has generously uh, provided funding for um, uh, these activities. So, with that, uh, Trudy, um, you have the floor, and. Uh, I don't know how PowerPoints work, so, but Tim over there, I think, does, so if you need to move anything there. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you for those generous introductions, and thank you for inviting me. It has been hard to tear myself away from the television and watch the events in Egypt. Um, I noticed, of course, when they burned the headquarters of the political party that they surely must have burned up records. We know that a... Um, police station in, I believe, Suez was ransacked, and the reports actually say that files were taken, and at least one other provincial government building was ransacked in Alexandria. So we know there's archives destruction already in that conflict situation. What I want to talk about today is archives and their importance in trying to reestablish some sort of equilibrium in the aftermath of conflict, which usually involves regime change. A couple of years ago, a wonderful Swiss NGO called Swiss Peace, with funding from the uh, Foreign Ministry of Switzerland, tried to come up with a scenario for looking at the unfinished business. How do you resolve uh, post-conflict trauma in countries. I'm going to see if this works. Yes. And this is what they came up with. Uh, this is copyright Swiss Peace and Swiss Foreign Ministry. And I have found it extremely useful for thinking about how archives play into uh, dealing with the past. And by the way, this just came out within the past two weeks it is the magazine of the Swiss Foreign Ministry, and this issue is simply called Dealing with the Past. Uh, I have an article in it, but there are lots of articles in here that relate to how the past features as part of reconciliation and conflict transformation. And I recommend it to you. It is online also, and it's free. Sure. Um, I'm going to take this diagram in which they look at things that relate to perpetrators and things that relate to victims. And I'm going to talk about each one of them. 
What I'd like you to look at, though, is the fact that there are things that do relate to perpetrators and things that do relate to victims. They relate to the rule of law, impunity, and reconciliation. Uh, I'm not as optimistic as the Swiss are on reconciliation, but I do think that you can get transformation, and I do think you can get the rule of law. So these four categories they have identified that I'm going to talk about are the transitional justice rights. The right to justice, no impunity. Institutional reform, so there is no recurrence. The right to know, and the right to reparation. Now, the right to justice, no impunity, means prosecuting, protecting witnesses, and monitoring trials. And I'm going to come back to each of these and then talk about how records and archives feature in those um, uh, events. Institutional reform, no recurrence, means rebuilding government structures. And in many cases, uh, this means rebuilding archives as well and rebuilding an archive system that actually works. But it, crucially, it means vetting public officials. The right to know typically has two kinds of demands in a post-conflict situation, locating the missing and truth-telling. And the right to reparations is restitution and moral and material compensation. So those are the four categories that the Swiss identified that I think really work pretty well. Now, one of the most important um, documents that has come out is the UN Principles Against Impunity of Perpetrators. Yeah. Um, that uh, you don't get off scot-free. That you are held accountable. No, it is not the words that's used in the international community. They use impunity. Then their principles a procedure like the TRC with amnesty if you no. come clean? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Um, and, and you'll see that in a minute. If you're, um, these were adopted in 1997. They were drafted by the famous French jurist Louis Joannet. And, to, and as far as I know, and I've met Joannet a couple of times, he was not contacting archivists at all. But in the process of drafting them, he came to the position that if you didn't protect archives, you could never hold perpetrators accountable. Uh, his principles then were uh, updated in 2005 by Diane Ortlicker, who was at that time at American University here and is now in the State Department uh, working for the Ambassador for War Crimes. Um, the principles concerning archives, then, he says there is a duty to know, and it's a personal right, and it is a collective right. But the state must make possible that knowing with a duty to remember. In the wor other words, a state should not sweep under its rug what happened in the past. And to do that, the state should ensure the preservation of and access to Archives Concerning Violations of Human Rights and Humanitarian Law. Here I want to note that the implication in that is that the state archives are the ones that are referred to. But as you will see this afternoon, it isn't just state archives that concern violations of human rights and humanitarian law. And I've argued that states have the duty to ensure the preservation of all archives, whether governmental or non-governmental, that concern the violations of human rights and humanitarian law. And so archivists are part of the duty bearers for human rights. Now, let me go to talking about these in terms of how archives play into these four categories. Uh, first of all, there's prosecutions. And we see prosecutions in domestic courts, in what are called hybrid courts, and what are, called, what are international courts. Domestic courts, uh, we see prosecutions, of course, in places like Guatemala. Um, I worked for a number of years with the police archives in Guatemala. We have just seen this autumn two policemen convicted for crimes during the period of the military dictatorship in Guatemala. And of the 750-some documents that were entered into the court case, uh, 
over 650 came from the police archives. That's archives in prosecution in domestic courts. Also, we have seen prosecution in Ethiopia using the documents that were accumulating during the DERG. Now, I have a lot of trouble with those prosecutions because some of them were in absentia. The interesting part of the prosecution, you would think, Ethiopia, what kind of records do we have that we could use to prosecute? But apparently the East Germans provided assistance in setting up the record systems in Ethiopia for the DERG, and they found very good records indeed, which allowed the prosecutions to go forward. A hybrid courts are those which are a mixed court which you have nationals and international appointees. The special court for Sierra Leone is a hybrid. It is a compact between the government of Sierra Leone and the United Nations, and it is a classic hybrid court. The other hybrid court right now is the one in Cambodia, in which you have um, both Cambodian nationals and uh, internationals in that court, both as prosecutors and as judges. That's another compact between the government of Cambodia and the United Nations. Then we have the true international courts, International Criminal Court, of course the uh, uh, International Court of Justice, which has been running for a century, but the new criminal courts are uh, both the permanent court and then the temporary court. International Criminal Tribunal for U former Yugoslavia, for Rwanda, and the International Tribunal for Lebanon. And those are international courts seated in uh, The Hague. All of these, of course, use records as part of the documents that um, are needed. Now, we certainly know that um, a wide variety of records have been used. If you think about the uh, Nuremberg uh, Tribunal, that used captured government records. Uh, you use government records, as I said, in Guatemala. Those are governmental records that are current government records. One of the interesting things, though, has been the expansion uh, from government records in these courts. For example, um, other governments' records have been importantly used. In the Fujimori case in Chile, um, Kate Doyle, who works for the National Security Archive, testified using documents that have been declassified from the United States. Also in the criminal tribunal for former Yugoslavia, uh, U.S. Uh, satellite overflight uh, records have been used to show the burial and reburial of mass graves. In addition to government records, then, you start to see some very interesting other records. And um, in the Yugoslav court, one of the sensations was when a personal video that had been made by one of the military officers while six uh, Bosnians were killed at Srebrenica. It was a group called the Scorpions. And one of them had a video camera and then was showing it around. Um, an NGO in Serbia obtained a copy and provided it to the court. An absolute sensation. But if you think about all of us with our cell phones that have cameras in them now, you can imagine that more and more of this is going to start to occur. And finally, you are seeing radio and television records used. In uh, Rwanda, it has been important to have the broadcast of Radio Mil Colin because that was part, of course, of the killing process. And those records have been used in those court cases. So you can see it's a wide variety of records. It's not just government records that get used in the prosecutions. Court monitoring also, you see that uh, court and police records are needed. Basically, in court monitoring, a, typically an NGO goes in to watch what's going on to see if this is a fair process. Um, really good court monitors then start to use records to see if there's a pattern. If it is a, a domestic relations case, is it always uh, simply not adjudicated? If police get a complaint of domestic abuse, do they always set it aside? 
So it uses records in investigation of patterns and trends to back up what they're seeing in the court monitoring activity. Now, going from prosecutions to institutional reform and the promotion of non-recurrence, you get to vetting. And I suspect you, like me, think first, of course, of lustration, the check process. And that, of course, is the classic vetting that we all know. It uses personnel records, it uses police records, it uses court records. But if you're trying to figure out who is a member of a group, it isn't just government that has these records, of course. Personnel records are kept by, frankly, everybody. Political parties, uh, an important source of records in uh, Germany, both from the Nazi period and, and from the Stasi period. But we also see personnel records um, when, for example, in Colombia, they captured a group of the FARC, and they captured computers. Uh, it's the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, the, the major, one of the two major rebel groups. Um, and when they captured the computer, what did they find? They found a list of personnel who belonged to that part of the FARC. So even the FARC keeps <coughs> track of who their personnel is. Um, the uh, There was a capture of a computer in Iraq a couple of years ago from Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and guess what? Personnel records on that computer, too. So you find personnel records in many different places, not just government, and they all can be used for vetting. People often say, well, how do you trust a personnel record? And I'd argue two things. First of all, Personnel records you don't think will ever get outside your circle, so they are pretty well kept. But secondly, they're self-reinforcing because you want to be paid, you want to have credit for your um, training, you want to have credit for your pension if there is one. And so personnel records tend to be more tr trustworthy than most and uh, are the principal source certainly for vetting. Now, those two are about holding perpetrators accountable. Now let's go to uh, victims' issues. Truth-seeking and the right to know. Uh, locating missing persons. Just like there is a need to understand an organizational structure when you're prosecuting, and here I would say that when we started to work in the police archives in Guatemala, it took us a long time to understand the police organizational structure and how it changed over time. The uh, Guatemala Police Archives has now produced a book which has been published on the organizational structure of the police over time and what it means. Usually if you're in an archives um, in a non-conflict situation, you can go to the organization and say, help me, uh, give me your organization charts for the past 40 years. In Guatemala, in the police archives, nobody wanted to help us, and so we didn't get any of them, and we had to figure it all out uh, retroactively by using the documents themselves. But just as in any good historical question, you need to understand the temporality of the event. You need to understand what happened before, during, and after, what's the context that the event is incurring in. You need then to link the structures and the event to the records, and in some cases you need to use medical records to support the exhumations. Um, I was really interested, um, right before Christmas, there was a news report out of Bolivia that the president of Bolivia invited the families of missing persons to come with him in January to the military archives to look at what he called the occult records uh, to see if we can locate missing persons. I don't know whether he, he's done that. I tried to find out yesterday and couldn't see any, any further. But this is interesting to me because in, when I was researching final acts here, I talked to the people who uh, were involved in the Bolivia Truth Commission. And the Bolivia Truth Commission ran from 82 to 84, and then the government cut it off without allowing it to finish, and the records of the Truth Commission I could not locate. Nobody in Bolivia that I could find was able to tell me where they were. 
Now we've got the president of Bolivia saying, I'm going to go and help families locate missing persons. I think that should be a pretty interesting uh, operation if it happens. And on top of that, I'd love to know if they find the Truth Commission records at the same time. Yeah. Could, could we wait with questions uh, until the end? Because we actually need – this event is being webcast live, so we need to wait for the microphone. I think it's just easier if we – let Trudy finish first. <clears throat> okay. Locating missing persons is typically a personal question, and it's one that truth commissions often don't answer. Uh, when the truth commission reported in Peru, you saw uh, people going out on the street from the media and interviewing people and saying, what do you think of the truth commission report? And the answer was, it doesn't tell me what happened to my brother. It doesn't happen to tell me what happened to my father. And that's why truth-seeking and the right to know through truth commissions is very different, frankly, than finding the missing. Truth commissions use a wide variety of records from any type of institution in any physical format, including personal papers. Now, the book I just have sent around from the Swiss um, Foreign Ministry has a new list of the number of truth commissions that have uh, taken place around the world. As you may know, the very first known truth commission was in Uganda and was set up by Idi Amin. Uh, that was in 1975. Um, it's a curious way for a phenomenon like the truth commissions to get started. But since that time, there are 45 now known <coughs> around the world. Um, and South Africa, as you uh, mentioned, Pat, uh, is the one that we all think about. Uh, when I did the book on truth commissions, there were actually more in Latin America than there were in Africa by that time. Um, truth commissions are uh, typically set up by government. There have been a few set up by churches. There were two truth commissions in Guatemala, for example, the first one set up by the Catholic Church, and then the international one. Some truth commissions are uh, people from the government only. Some truth commissions, particularly now in uh, Central America, have been mixed, where there are commissioners both national and international. I'm doing some work right now with the truth commission in Honduras. And that is a mixed commission with three commissioners from outside the country. The chair is from Guatemala. There's a commissioner from Canada and one from Peru. And then there are two Hondurans. Um, so you see a wide use of records. Let me talk about a couple of them. Um, right now, Canada is running a truth commission on how Native American children were treated in uh, schools uh, where they were taken from families and put in essentially boarding schools. Unlike the United States, those schools in Canada turn out to have been mostly run by churches. And so the Truth Commission in Canada is heavily reliant now on the record keeping of churches and church schools for the evidence that they need for the Truth Commission. So there's a, a government commission, but it's using church records as a base for its investigations. Um, another one that's interesting now in Honduras is they woke up one morning and WikiLeaks had a number of documents that pertain directly um, to their investigation. Because if you recall the events of summer 2009, the president of Honduras was bundled into an airplane and flown to Costa Rica. And a coup government took over. He then managed to get himself back into Honduras and took refuge in the Brazilian embassy. Well, WikiLeaks has information coming from the U.S. Embassy in Brazil as to what the Brazilians were telling them about what was going on with their guest, the ousted president, in their embassy in Honduras. Now, yes, probably the Truth Commission in Honduras could have, through diplomatic means, gotten those documents from the United States. But it would have taken a while. And instead, they woke up one morning in December, and they had 
the documents delivered to them. Uh, interviews are an incredibly important part of a Truth Commission operation. This has uh, caused some difficulty in at least one country, and that's Sierra Leone. And Sierra Leone is one of a, a very few countries where both a Truth Commission and an international prosecution were going on at the same time. And I've talked to people in Sierra Leone who think this was the worst idea in the world and some people who say it didn't matter at all. But what did happen was then that the uh, prosecutor had to promise that nothing that was told to the Truth Commission would be used in the prosecutions themselves. And that then made it a very difficult uh, path for the prosecutor to follow. He seems to have been uh, very successful at it. Um, they have convicted everyone and they're in their last trial right now. But it did mean that you had a truth commission and a prosecution running and the interviews were very tricky. Restitution is the fourth part of it. Um, uh, to restore the victim to the original situation before the gross violations. Here again, there's been a very important a document adopted by the UN, not perhaps as important as the Joanne principles are, but in uh, December 2005, the General Assembly adopted a set of basic principles on remedies and restitutions. Um, we get a number of kinds of restitutions, and I'm going to talk about several of them uh, that have a, an important element of documentation, but there are a number of others, and I'll mention them at the end. Of course, one restitution is return of property, and that means who owned it first. For real property, of course, you have to have land records, you have to have notorial records, you have to have cartography. Um, this has been an important element in the post-Soviet period in Eastern Europe. It, of course, was a part of the whole Nazi art issues that we have seen uh, over the past decade. Um, one I'd mentioned to you that's very interesting, after the Asians were kicked out of Uganda by Idi Amin and they lost real property um, in the process, they needed to have someone go in and figure out what was it that the Asians had lost such that they would be given some compensation. My prediction is that at some time this will all come unstuck again because the compensation was not very great. But the UN High Commissioner for Refugees was asked to take the um, attestations of property lost from the uh, Uganda Asians that were kicked out. And so in the archives at the UN High Commissioner for Refugees in Geneva are all the documentations of the property that the uh, Uganda Asians had. And someday those, I think, will be not only important for reclaiming property, but it will give historians this marvelous opportunity to see what indeed that sector of the population actually owned. It will be an incredible source when that becomes available. <coughs> um, another real property issue has been, of course, um, in Israel-Palestine. And here what happened is the British had the Ottoman land records, uh, and there's been a very nice book written about this, by the way, um, but they had the Ottoman land records and they were worried what was going to happen after uh, the establishment of Israel. And so they went in and microfilmed them and gave a, made a couple of sets of microfilm, one of which went to the United Nations. And it's in the United Nations archives. And about five years ago, I believe the Egyptians paid for it and it has all been digitized now and is available to anyone uh, who needs to use the Ottoman records of the land ownership in what was the Ottoman province of Palestine. Okay, personal property, you find many records useful. If you think about the stories that we have been inundated with the past decade on the uh, restoration of art to people whose uh, art was taken during the 
uh, Nazi period, you will see what variety of records have been used in those claims cases. Another one, though, is uh, a whole different restitution, and that's restoring citizenship, the right to vote, employment, and other kinds of civil rights. And for that, you need birth, death, and marriage records, you need employment records, you need court records. Um, you saw this in Kosovo. When the Serbian army moved into Kosovo and the Kosovars fled into Albania and into Macedonia, the military was stopping the Kosovars at the border and taking every document they had on them. And there were pictures of piles of uh, identity documents, passports, uh, titles to houses, titles to buildings around the feet of the Serbian army officers. And those people came into Macedonia with absolutely no way to prove who they were or what they owned, who they were related to. And it was one of the things, again, the High Commissioner for Refugees had to begin to establish uh, refugee documentation for them. But there is a case where to restore the citizenship, to restore the right to vote, to restore um, the employment rights uh, benefits, um, it's important to have documentation somewhere that allows you to do that. Then there's compensation, which is payment for the economically accessible damage. And here, of course, you also get um, restoration of that through use of government records, including those of security forces. You get NGO records, you get employment records. Uh, all of these can be used then to try to figure out what did exist, what was damaged, and what was accessible. Um, then you see compensation, which is not economically accessible per se, but is indeed um, compensation for harm. And in the United States, we saw this in the late 80s in which there was a compensation for the Japanese who were in the camps during World War II. I was at the U.S. National Archives at that time, and we had an early variety of punch cards that had been used to record who was in the camp. And we managed to get those punch cards restored to a computer database by using a firm in uh, St. Louis, as I recall, which actually could handle the old punch cards. In addition, NGOs in the Japanese-American community had put together records of who was in the camps. And so by combining government records and NGO records, you ended up with a list of persons uh, that could be used by the Justice Department to pay out the compensation that Congress had authorized. That's not economically accessible damage. It's another kind of compensation. There's also, of course, symbolic compensation, which is like monuments. And here again, if you go up by Union Station, you will see the monument to the Japanese Americans. It sits on a, a stretch of land up there. There is also compensation that is given to communities and groups, such as rebuilding schools, uh, providing educational opportunities or scholarships, uh, building health centers, and so forth. The final part of it, then, is to preserve the records of the transitional justice institutions, the courts, the truth commissions, the compensation claims commissions, and so forth. Uh, here I'll just give you the very latest information, which is that the UN Security Council passed a resolution right before Christmas in which they have established a continuing mechanism. That's mechanism with a capital M to handle the records of the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia and the Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. The mechanism will have two arms. It will have a seat in The Hague and a seat in Arusha, Tanzania, which is where the two courts sit right now. And the mechanism very specifically says, uh, the, the authorization for the mechanism says, the records of the two tribunals are United Nations records to be managed by the residual mechanism and to have access provided to them. So 
that's a long step forward. I think we were, many of us were worried about what was going to happen to the records of these courts, and we now have it in black and white that they will be maintained and there will be access, and that's an important breakthrough for us all. <coughs> Preserving the records of truth commissions has been very tough. Um, it's a mixed bag. Some countries do it very well, some don't. Um, the United Nations has records of three truth commissions, Burundi, El Salvador, and Guatemala. All of them are sitting there unprocessed, and none of them, I'm sorry to say, is available. Um, right now, you're trying to figure out, we're trying to figure out what will happen to make sure we preserve the records of the truth commission in Honduras, where I'm working. It is not as simple as it sounds. These are very dangerous records. There are records that affect uh, living people, often people who are still active in political life. And uh, it's important to secure them uh, to make sure that they are not in danger of inadvertent or advertent destruction. So what do archivists do? We try to weigh the human rights uses when we appraise the records. <coughs> we realize that the right to know includes the right to know what is in the archives. And here I will tell you that right now the International Council on Archives um, is working on a statement of principles on access to archives. I'm going to a meeting there. Uh, I'll be chairing it next Monday and Tuesday. And it is um, trying to put together a worldwide statement on the right to know what is in the archives. And then finally, archivists, of course, have to provide both description and legal authorization in which to provide access to the archives that allow human rights um, and post-conflict transitions to take place. People say, well, let's just get rid of these things. And as you may know, the Greeks burned the records of their military security services after the end of the rule of the uh, colonels. Uh, that's been a, a real problem, I think, in Greece. I like this quote. Alex Bahrain was the deputy to uh, Desmond Tutu in the South Africa Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And he said in his book about the commission, it was necessary to turn the page of history, but first we needed to read that page. And that's where archives come in, because we are the pages that need to be read. Thank you very much. Thank you. Trudy, could I ask a question going back to the very beginning of your presentation, and it's about uh, whether there is anything that resembles a consensus internationally about what, uh, how, when uh, archives should be uh, accessible, because there's such a wide range. Uh, for example, the South Africans are way out in front. Some of the European countries, Belgium, for example, still is adhered to a 50-year rule and so on. When you're, another way of putting this is that when you're talking to uh, archivists in places that don't have uh, access to archives, what, what type of advice do you uh, give them? Do you say that, well, 30 years is probably as good as any other for? Let me answer that in two parts. First of all, no, there is no international standard. Um, and there is not an international consensus. In part, it depends on Freedom of Information Acts. If you're talking about governments with Freedom of Information Acts, then that typically governs archives as well. Um, you may have seen uh, recently uh, some articles about India and the use of a Freedom of Information Act there, and one of the activists has been killed now, um, who was very prominent in using the Freedom of Information Act. So you get that as a factor. The second factor is that you're starting to see an emerging consensus in the international organizations, the United Nations, World Bank, and so forth. And they're starting to move to 20 years instead of 30. And so that's uh, an important um, element. What we have seen in Germany also is that there was a uh, position of 20 years ago that there was privacy for 30 years after death. That's now moved to 20 years after death. So the, the years are coming down. Um, but there is no international standard. Um, the argument that I would always make is 
uh, privacy ends at death. Obviously, the Germans don't buy that. But in general, you're starting to push that, saying, well, if someone is dead, harm cannot come to them from release of this, this information. Thank you. The, the floor is open for questions. Please wait for the microphone. While you're thinking about your question, let me ask <clears throat> you something, Trudy. As you talk about archives and records um, after conflicts, um, is there in your case ever a case to be made for archives for records to be destroyed? Well, archives always destroy records because most of the records that are created are not worth saving. I mean, they're buying paper for computers and their travel vouchers and so forth. As to whether or not there is an argument for destroying um, the records of a secret service like the Greeks did, I say no, there is not. What I do say is that we could have gone into the police archives in Guatemala and we had all of the things like uh, the receipts for buying gas for police cars. And I said, you know, th there's no reason to save these. Well, politically, it was so sensitive that they weren't going to destroy anything. And so, as far as I know, uh, all the receipts for putting gas in police cars are still sitting there. Now, like any other uh, thing, you can make the argument that, well, if you knew somebody put a gas in a police car at this gas station on this day at this hour, we could prove that they were there. I've got to tell you, that is a horribly hard way to go about finding out that somebody was in that place. It's a lot easier to find the order uh, that was given to tell somebody to be there. Um, that argument was also made, as you may know, after um, the end of the war in Germany, where there was an argument saying if you could only get all the steel that went into making paper clips, you could figure out what had gone wrong in the German armaments program. Okay, I mean, any good historian can make this argument. We can all think of ways to use this, but it's not very practical. If, however, we turn to records of security services, my answer is no. Let me tell you about an, uh, a situation that's going on right now in Hungary. Uh, and that I don't. was on my mind, yes. Uh, uh, okay. Um, as you may know, in the government in Hungary is a right of center government, and it has complete control. It dominates uh, the parliament, so it can pass, frankly, anything it wants. Um, in the autumn, it decided and that it was going to get rid of a lot of artwork from uh, the Soviet uh, dominant period. Uh, it argued that it was going to sell it all off to pay for the victims of the dam break in Hungary when the red sludge we saw was going over the countryside. Well, right before Christmas, um, the uh, member of parliament, who is the uh, parliamentary secretary, the, the junior uh, member, uh, in charge of the Ministry of Justice, announced that by... November of this year, they are going to pass a bill which will allow anyone who has a personal file in the records of the security services uh, during the communist period uh, to go in and take out your file and take it home and do with it what you will. Put it on the internet, destroy it, whatever. And they intend to pass this legislation before November. Um, it's, they haven't introduced it. It's not at all clear um, whether they actually will or whether this was a scare tactic. Um, it was said at the same time that the government closed down a small commission, which was a historian and a couple of archivists, to look at some computer data from the uh, secret police that had not yet been analyzed. And the government closed that down, so they never completed their work there was no publication, and then the government said, well, or, or this minister said, well, we really shouldn't have this stuff in the first place, and we're going to let citizens take home their files. Um, a, a man in Canada has a whole website devoted to this. There's, a, a, there's blogs on it. Um, it's not clear to me what's really going to happen here. Uh, one of my colleagues in Hungary uh, wrote me this week and said he thought it had settled down but it's very, very worrisome. <laughs>
when you get a government that is so dominant. I mean, they can pass this without anybody helping them if they wish to, um, uh, saying that they wish to destroy records. Okay. Ross, or Don, I guess, has the... Okay. Don Wolf. Thank, thank you for that, uh, Trudy. I was in uh, Arusha last uh, December and January, having nothing to do with the International Tribunal there, but I became aware of their presence because of all the new housing that had gone up and the effect that the, the existence of the tribunal that had on housing prices and other prices in the area, but I understand that is not a obviously a permanent facility, and it just raised the question in my mind as to what is done both with the records that are used in the trials as well as those generated by the trials. Is there a set rule as to where those various records will revert once that tribunal uh, is finished? That's what's going to stay in the residual mechanism in Arusha and the residual mechanism in The Hague under UN custody. So that's that's where those are going. Ross, uh, hmm. Trudy, uh, two questions. Um, the first goes to um, destruction of records. Um, I helped destroy um, two <laughs> categories of Radio Free Europe corporate records, and and my question to you is whether that was the right thing to do. Um, we found um, sort of endless endless compilations of timesheets, right? didn't see what anybody could do with those. And then we found endless records of the company doctor, okay, people's personal medical records. In theory, that could help, F, you know, way later, but we destroyed yeah. those. Okay, <clears throat> is that right? Sure. Uh, the other question is more general. Um, if, you know, if the principle is uh, the privacy right ends at death or X years after death, um, how should we think about... Um, release of material before that that's redacted uh, on privacy grounds, which involves uh, individual judgments about what's to be redacted. Mm -hmm. And we see what, you know, what comes out of U.S. government efforts is hit or miss, actually. So how, how should we think about, does it make sense to uh, get redacted stuff released before such, um, such deadlines? Um, to take your first question, of course you destroy that kind of corporate record. Um, it makes no sense to hold timesheets and gas records and things like that. Um, archivists fuss over this. Um, it depends on what you're looking at. If you're looking at the records of, say, the post office department, you're probably going to destroy 99% of it. You've probably got 1% that really is historically valuable. If you're looking at the CIA, you're probably saving 40, 50%. The rest is other sorts of things. Um, so, of course, you have to destroy that kind of stuff. We would all be wallowing in, in documentation if we didn't. And it's no help to uh, uh, future users to make them wallow through that kind of stuff to get to what they really need. Um, you could say, gee, who are you to make a judgment? And I say, well, that's why I'm a historian and an archivist. That's the kind of judgment you make, and that's your responsibility. Yep. Um, and that's why I think being a historian is the right background for an archivist, but that's another whole lecture. Um, the, the question about redaction, I believe in redaction, because otherwise you get a 60-page document that's withheld because one page can't be released. You get a five-page document withheld because you've got a name that can't be released. And you have to do that. We will never get documents out in any kind of timely fashion if we don't do that. Um, now, it is absolutely true that you can send the same document through three times, and you get three different people doing three different redactions. And the National Security Archives has been very good at being able to take these and send, take the three different ones and piece the whole thing together, and you get the whole document. Uh, that's a matter of internal discipline in the agencies doing the redaction. But yes, I think it's an important tool, and, and we have to use it. Otherwise, uh, you will simply withhold way, way, way too much. There, there are a number of people who are, <clears throat> would like to intervene. Let me ask, though, this is a quick follow-up. It depends in part, of course, what you're looking for. And uh, social, cultural historians, historians of medicine, of health, so forth, might actually be quite interested in those records had they been sort of a complete body been preserved. Um, so it partly depends on what you're looking for. But um, Charlie Mayer and then Professor Nelson. Charlie. 
the uh, th this is this is interesting. I've used uh, well, I I was visited people who were involved with the Truth Commission uh, in the in the 90s, and uh, and I my own work on East Germany involved mm -hmm. records that. Uh, thanks to the citizens' movements, were put in public mm -hmm. access early. But what I, the question I have is, and it's not a, maybe it's too vague, but is there, you've, you've put the emphasis on preservation for all sorts of reasons, uh, historians' reasons and the reasons of justice, victims and uh, right. compensation and the like. Uh, and you've also, you just now you've alluded to the distinction between preservation and access. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder what happens. Do these ever come in conflict? Uh, I mean, between uh, what you th you're thinking of, you know, my, my need to go to the archives to write a history of the end of East Germany is different from somebody who's been fired or who's, uh, you know, been politically prosecuted, and uh, the uh, inst and the need of the person who's being accused often to have some aspect in his defense, which I think we have to recognize, is also different from my need, let's say, to want to expose uh, everything. And I, I don't know whether you know. Your, your talk, I think, presupposes that preservation, uh, that these things are ne always sort of in alignment. And obviously preservation is the, the sine qua non for access, but uh, I just wonder whether you might speak mm -hmm. a little further on that. Yes. Um, anytime you're dealing with uh, sensitive records, you think about categories of users, and different categories of users have different rights. So one of the things we're trying to write into these principles that uh, we're going to look at at the International Council on Archives, you have the person who is named in the document. You have, uh, if you may have a defendant who needs documents for their uh, purposes. You may have, of course, an heir or someone who has a legal authorization to act on behalf of someone. Uh, you have um, lawyers. Um, who are defense lawyers, prosecution lawyers, who may or may not have anything to do with the case that, that you have the records about. They may be working on a whole separate case, and yet they want to use those records. Um, uh, you have journalists. You have communities who want to come back in and do some sort of a memorial of some sort, and they want records relating to the people in that community for communal purposes. Um, you have then journalists uh, who make an argument that they are a multiplier effect and so they need uh, certain kinds of access, and then you have academic users. And what archivists try to do when we're dealing with very de delicate records, like tribunals, like truth commissions, is to <coughs> set up essentially a matrix and look at the various categories and then look at the kinds of access each of these will get in the immediate future. Over the long term, of course, victims, defense, lawyers all fall away, and then it becomes an issue for uh, academic historians and others. But in the short term, you really think about it in a matrix format, and which is the user and what kind of access do they get. For example, let's say that um, you decide that anybody who comes in can see his secret police file, but you're going to take out um, all the names of other people. And so you're going to redact, and, and to use a, um, a, the discussion we just had. If you're going to do it for one, then you've got to do it for everybody. You can't say, I'm going to do it for you because I like your blue eyes, and I don't, I'm not going to do it for you because I don't like you. You have to make those things, um, those decisions. But having made that decision, it doesn't mean because I give you your file that that file then automatically becomes public. You get it because it's on you, or you get it because you need it for your defense, but that does not make it public. However, once you decide that one member of the public is going to get that file, whatever it is, then all members of the public should get that file. In other words, if you release it to one historian, you're releasing it to all historians. What happens, quick call, what sure. happens if, Microphone. You, hmm? if, if you release release it, and then the person to whom it's released makes it a question of public record. I mean, Tim ah. Gardner Nash published a wonderful little memoir of his, uh, yes, yes, of, of his, of his in, file, in, in, in part right. because he had, right. obviously, this girlfriend. In, but, uh, in, in fact, in general, um, that, I think, um, needs to be supported. As 
some of you may know, there was a real problem in the Czech Republic because at the time of lustration, you could get your file, but you didn't have the authority to make it public. And I had a, a colleague in, in the Czech Republic at that time who had been a dissident and wanted to make his file public. He wanted to show what kind of damage had been done to him, and he couldn't. And I understand the Czech government has now changed that, but I think that's absolutely appropriate and the, the way to do it. That does mean, however, that anybody doing redacting has to be aware that once you let it out, that is possible. All right. Professor Nelson. I have a couple of, I have a couple <laughs> of questions, Trudy. One is, you mentioned the UN, and I'm, I'm interested in the fact that they, there's some part of the UN, evidently, that's interesting, interested in in preserving these archives. So I'm kind of curious about that. The second question is, or I guess it's something I want you to tell us. Not every archive you ever walked into had four walls, a ceiling, and temperature control. <laughs> um, and I like, I just think you could pass along some some anecdotes, really, but it tells you a lot about what the country's like. And, the, and, and in your case, you've been you started this a long time ago. I mean, I remember when you were in the the Kazakh stands, the stands, and after a while, I I realized that Doonesbury was calling it the Berserker stands, and uh, that's what they were. But but I just give us a, a taste of that. Uh, let me do the UN first. Um, the United Nations Archives per se is in New York. Um, that's the headquarters archives. If you are looking, for example for the records of one of the uh, military um, units that is put in temporarily in a country, UNIFIL in Lebanon, for example, or all the different names that it's gone by in the Congo. Those records come back to UN headquarters, New York. UNPROFOR out of uh, Yugoslavia uh, has been in Europe for a long time and it's now coming in, into the archives in New York. In addition, independent organizations within the UN family all run their own archives. So the High Commissioner for Refugees has its archives. Um, World Bank has its, World Health has its, and so on. So the independent agencies run their own archives, and that they should, uh, because these are mammoth archives now that date from typically World War II or earlier. Um, so that's the way that system runs. If it is national, it is, if it is out of the Security Council in the UN, which is all these peacekeeping operations, then they come to New York. So if you just think about it as anything that occurs in New York and anything that's authorized by the Security Council, that's New York's business. And that's why the tribunal records are ostensibly under that umbrella. Okay, well, stories. Um, <laughs> paper yeah. records you're talking about? Doesn't matter. No, but I'm just, I'm just, they are mostly paper going to New York, or are they digital? It's, it's both. both. And it's also video, of course. As you can imagine, the tribunal's uh, video holdings are mammoth, and those are going to be sitting in, in both The Hague and, and Arusha. Because in the courtrooms, they have, this is a, a sidelight, but if, if you've ever uh, seen pictures on television of the courtroom in, say, Yugoslavia, that courtroom uh, will have cameras in at least the four corners. And those all run, you know, one's on the judges, one's on whoever is the witness, one is on the attorney, one's on the defendant. Those hmm. all go into uh, just a, like a commercial television station mixing booth where they put together one story okay, which is basically who is speaking. And then that is redacted of anything where it's a protected witness or where, uh, as was often the case with people like Milosevic, they blurted out the names of protected witnesses just to harass them, and they would have to be cut out. So then a, a copy is made that is publicly releasable, and that goes out. So for every hour, you have six videotapes. The four that are the raw tape coming off the corners, the combined master, and the edited master. And then on top of that, you have all the sound. You have English, French, 
in the Yugoslav case, you would of course have Serbian. Uh, uh, it used to be called Serbo-Croatian. Now it's called something very fancy. SCB. SCB, yeah. Serbo-Croatian, Bosnian. Uh, if it was a Yugoslav uh, Albanian who was testifying, then you would also have Albanian. Uh, you would have one tape that had whatever was the language that was actually spoken, called the floor, and then you would have all the streams in one language because the judges have to listen in French or the judges have to listen in English or the defendant has to listen in Serbian. So you would have again. So it's easy to have 11 uh, hours of audiovisual record for one hour of court. That's how big these things are. They're absolutely mammoth. Okay, Anna wanted me to tell a couple stories. Um, the police archives in Guatemala wasn't in an archives. It was in uh, police barracks in a police base in the northern part of Guatemala City um, in a not very good area. Um, it was in many ways a dumping ground for old files. Um, the buildings were in horrible, horrible condition. Uh, most of them didn't have lights. Uh, they had skylights uh, that were broken. The first time I was there, it was in September. It was rainy season. I was standing trying to look at a bunch of index cards. Um, I was standing in water. There was water dripping on my head. The cards were covered with hors d'oeuvre, uh, you know, sort of bird stuff and whatever. And as I'm standing there trying to get a grip on what am I looking at, I get dive-bombed by a bat. It's the only time I've ever been in archives and be dive-bombed by a bat. It took us years to get the bats out of the police archives. I, every time I went, I would write a report saying, get the bats out, get the bats out. And I'd come back, and the bats would still be there. Uh, I, they finally, finally got them out because you had to get the building sealed and you had to get it sealed all the time to get the bats out and of course that takes money and takes cooperation so that that's a bad situation uh, but it's a lot better now and it's a lot better because of uh, donors not the US uh, but donors like Sweden and Switzerland and others who put a lot of money into that operation uh, one of the worst places I've been for this is um, Sierra Leone Sierra Leone does not have a National Archives building. Um, at the end of the British colonial period, uh, the British sent somebody out to establish an archives to put the colonial records. They took a floor in one of the buildings at the university. That wasn't the worst thing because the university is up on a hill, and so at least it gets breezes. Um, of course, they outgrew that, so they took another floor and then they didn't have enough room, and so they took another building across the way, which, by the way, is now named for John Kennedy, and they took a floor to up at the top of that building. Um, when I first started to go there, <coughs> um, there was no electricity. They, and so as hot as it is, you have to leave the windows open. Um, that means you get birds, bats, and butterflies uh, coming in. You don't have any choice. Um, you can't do anything about preservation because you just don't have any control. You don't have any electricity. Um, there was a uh, Xerox machine sitting in the corner. Uh, it didn't work. Um, they had had a microfilm reader. Nobody could remember the last time it was used. Um, and yet in this mess, they never had a computer, were sitting the records of the, South, of the Sierra Leone Truth Commission, audio tapes, videotapes computer records, um, you know, and they're sitting in those conditions. There is no way that that government is going to have enough money to create a building. So you've got to find a donor uh, government who is interested enough that will begin to put brick and mortar together uh, to take care of that. Then when you start to say, well, the special court for Sierra Leone is going to wrap up, where are those records going to go? You look at that archives and you say, this can't be. I mean, you know, these aren't going to survive. And yet, in there's the Truth Commission and also the very important records of demobilization of the military forces. And while you would say, well, gee, I mean, you know, turning in your weapons and turning yourself in, what's the importance there? 
oh my, that's wonderful history eventually for what was actually the military situation at the time the conflict ended. It's awful. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, there have been any number of attempts to try to get uh, donors interested in helping build a building there, but that's very, very hard. Okay. Let's take a couple more questions. Uh, Pat, just a moment. First, the, the lady in the all the way in the back there, and to you as well. <clears throat> um, I just wanted to ask a question about um, archiving and I, I guess part of this is is spurred by what's going on in Egypt now, but a lot of the things that are going on, well, you mentioned a case of um, somebody's personal video being used and being included in archives, but what about electronic communications? And, um, you know, if you were trying to archive or, 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 or be able to use stuff that's going on in Egypt now that they're using social networking and things like that, is there any way there is of capturing that in order you know, how, how do archivists do this, even email? You know, how, how would they put together archives from this kind of evanescent material? All modern archives work with electronic records. Um, the U.S. National Archives has been working with electronic records since the 60s. Um, and yes, it is uh, a much more complicated um, technical uh, process. You have to have good technical people to help you do it. But you have to capture the electronic traffic in government. You have to capture, as we've seen in WikiLeaks, you know, you had to capture that cable traffic. You have to capture email traffic. You have to make judgments, just like you do with anything else, what to save and what to toss. So it's just part of the business. Microphone, hold on. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So um, would that be, would, would, would there be somebody then who is, for instance, monitoring the social networking that was going on in the case of Egypt, the Iranian revolutionary activities? There be somebody who was, who was putting that together, or is that just lost? Well, remember that archives basically are archives of institutions, okay? And so you're going to get the, whatever the institutional record is that flows into the State Department is going to be saved through the State Department record. Um, there are, of course, things that try to capture the Internet qua Internet, and the Wayback Machine is the one that's most famous. Um, but as, and there probably are people now who are deciding, usually at a big university somewhere, that they are going to go out and try to capture the social network stuff that's going on out of Egypt. Uh, I would look for the big Middle East study centers in various places that will probably take it upon themselves to do that. But So it will be a variety of sources, again, that you will use to do that. Down the road, it's the Egyptian intelligence agency that probably yeah, is a I was, source I was, I was thinking well, of that and, also and, when she started talking right. about institutions. And, and, the, like, and <clears throat> the big news media. I mean, they, will, they all have their archives. Those are very valuable to them. All right. Pat. Uh, I'm Pat Harahan. A few years ago, I was in South Africa, and I was at an international congress, mm -hmm. uh, and the, the topic was international military history. And uh, a discussion uh, at its session was uh, turned from history to archives. Uh, and the question, uh, the archivist, the military archivist of South Africa stood up and explained where her archives was and so on. Mm -hmm. And then an officer stood up on the other side of the room and said, what about those records you destroyed? Uh, and my question is, do archivists have a responsibility to, to explain records that possibly aren't there, uh, that have been destroyed, on these commissions and things of that sort? Um, yes. The short answer is I think that's one of the responsibilities of archivists. When you decide to destroy something, you document it. As you may know, in the U.S. government, by law, we must publish <coughs> if we intend to destroy. Um, and it's published in the Federal Register. Nobody reads it. I know that. But, but it is, it, if the U.S. government uh, determines that records are permanent and they're going to be retained, you have no responsibility to publish. But if you are going to destroy, then you must publish and allow a time for people to come in and object. And when I worked at the U.S. National Archives, there were times when people came in and objected 
to indeed a, a proposed destruction. But yes, that is something that archivists have to do. If they're going to appraise records and they have to do an appraisal report and say what they're going to save and what they're going to toss. Um, I'm, I, when we were working, when I was working with the uh, uh, Special Court for Sierra Leone, for example, one of the things I did was I read all the appraisal reports that they had for all the parts of the court and said, you know, does this make sense or not, and uh, gave them feedback on it. So that's the way it works, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, the colleague from the National Security Archive. Um, hi, I just wanted to address your question really quickly. I, I'm um, pretty sure I heard that the Library of Congress was saving all Twitters that were ever sent for historical and cultural, um, you know, value. So I thought that was kind of interesting, you know, according to um, social networking. Also, um, I just wanted to mention, kind of follow up with what um, Mr. Osterman said, that um, I, when I was working at the Maryland State Archives, there was a large discussion on whether or not to destroy, you know, thousands and even maybe millions of records of um, parking tickets over the years. And um, we kind of decided that it was important to save some of them because maybe a historian, you know, 200 years from now was wondering what a car is and why you'd get a parking ticket. Um, so that was, you know, just for, for cultural, more, you know, fun things of looking back in history. And then also, um, to another anecdote from the National Police Archives um, is uh, they found a lot of records of um, repair orders for military vehicles or police vehicles and um, especially in situations where there were unmarked police cars and and plainclothes policemen it was very important to have this record of which vehicles were owned by the police because then if you know if um, a witness got the license plate numbers of, of a vehicle that disappeared to person you're able to say well that vehicle is actually owned by the national police so it's very interesting how you wouldn't necessarily think that that document would be important but just you know what um, Dr. Peterson was saying is that any kinds of records can be very important in truth commission mm -hmm. thank you Sonia Um, I'm just wondering if it isn't, wouldn't be cheaper to just go in and digitize all these records, like in Sierra Leone, just take a camera and a tripod and just, you know, or a scanner and just set it up and then you have, and then it's more easily accessible, Re cheaper than building a building and, and, and you can always, you know, organize it afterwards even once you've just preserved it that way. Well, you've got about three problems there. Um, the first is that you always have to see what a court will accept as an authentic document. And most courts around the world are still locked to paper. So even if you have an electronic version, um, at this point, in many countries, you've got to save the paper for legal purposes. Um, secondly, preserving electronic records is no mean trick. And in a country with an electronic problem like Sierra Leone's, um, I'm not sure that they could safely produce it, uh, pr protect it. At that point, then, you would have to find a friendly government or other institution which would take that preservation task. I've been trying to do that for a number of entities. It is no mean trick to find somebody who is willing to do that. Uh, usually what you find are people are willing to take it, but they also want to make it available. And governments don't typically want that. They want to control that information and uh, how it goes out and when. And so to find somebody who will be basically a Swiss bank lockbox for electronic records of another government is pretty tough. Um, the final thing is it's not cheap to digitize. Um, the, the, there are a number of cost um, estimates now running around, but it's like somewhere between a dollar and a quarter and a dollar seventy-five to do a decent job of digitizing. And so your digital copying operations are very expensive. And uh, to think about trying to do, yeah, yeah. Because you, you have to have, well, but, but you have to have uh, identification on all those so you can get back to them. You have to have them in decent order. You have to have them cleaned up enough and repaired enough and all of this. It, it's simply not cheap. And so while you can indeed 
think of making digital copies of portions of it, uh, to think of making an entire government's archives seems pretty implausible. I have to tell you, since we started on Egypt, we'll end on Egypt, uh, I was at an international meeting talking to one of the Egyptian archivists um, a year and a half ago. And uh, she said that with the help of, I think it was IBM, but one of the big companies went in, and that they had made digital copies of the archives of Egypt. And I said, my goodness, and what does this mean? Well, I said, how many pages is it? And it worked out to be about a million pages. <coughs> There's 2,000 pages a foot, okay? So that's 500 feet. That's not, by <laughs> any stretch of the imagination, the archives of Egypt. Now, if that's all that the uh, official archives had control of, that's another whole problem. But it is the only country in the world I know of where somebody is bragging that the government archives is entirely in digital format, and I think that's because <laughs> it isn't the real archives. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Jim Grossman? I'm curious. What I'm Microphone, hold on. Can use mine. I'll use this one. Uh, I'm curious as to what the most, th what the thorniest ethical considerations are, and this goes back, I think, to in where we started in some ways. Some of these thorny issues about uh, records that should never exist in the first place, uh, and those getting made public. So, what are the, th what are the most difficult ethical issues that uh, archivists who are dealing with these kinds of very sensitive records? confront and what kinds of um, ethical guidelines, professional ethical guidelines, help with those? Uh, let me take it in reverse order. Uh, there are, there's a code of ethics that the International Council on Archives has promulgated for all archives in the world and the Society of American Archivists has a set of ethical guidelines as well. Uh, in addition, uh, you have ones in the federal government and in state governments and so forth that um, guide you as well. Um, obviously, uh, access is the big issue, and what is available to whom when. That matrix problem is a, a huge one. Let me give you two examples that I think are real um, naughty problems. One, I don't know if you all remember this, but last October it was revealed that the U.S. government had worked with Guatemala in the period 1946 to 48 and had done syphilis experiments on uh, people in prison, uh, military, um, on uh, prostitutes. This uh, information was in the records that were the Public Health Service. The investigator then went to uh, University of Pittsburgh, took, took the records with him, considered them his own, gave them to the archives at Pittsburgh, at the university. After he died, the access to it was transferred to the head of the medical, one of the public health uh, institutions at Pitt. Um, the archivist described the records, created a finding aid, never alerted anyone to the fact that this was an unethical, immoral, illegal violation of human rights that had just been perpetrated and all that record was there. The, a researcher then came in to use the material apparently was granted access to it by the head of the health service without ever looking at the records. The archivist made it available. The researcher then published, uh, did a speech on it at a convention, did not alert anybody that this had happened. Only finally, when the researcher was ready to write um, an article on this and sent it to somebody in the public health service and said, did I get the science right, of all things, that somebody tumbled to the fact of what we had here, which is a gross violation of human rights by the government of Guatemala, the government of the United States, and the Latin American uh, branch of the World Health Organization, the public uh, Pan-American Health Organization. 
what happened then was that the um, so everybody in this story is wrong, as far as I can tell. The um, University of Pittsburgh then took the finding aid off its website. I asked for a copy of the of the finding aid. They refused to provide it to me. Um, I am told, but it has not been made public, uh, that uh, the records are being transferred indeed to the National Archives to the Public Health Service uh, record group in it. Uh, but this was just unethical in every way I can imagine. And how you could look at those records and not signal to somebody that there is something wrong here, I can't imagine. But that's, that's easy. That, that, that's easy in the sense that you can say that's unethical. I'm more interested in the situations, especially dealing with truth commissions, of where there are ethical dilemmas. And that's what I'm curious about. Where do you find ethical dilemmas where, the, where there are questions of ethics that are not so easy, where in, in essence a group of archivists or archivists and historians have to sit around and say, what is the right thing to do? Are there, are there cases that are where it's not clear? Well, let me give you another example. Um, the Truth Commission in Guatemala, which obviously I know a bit more about than most, but um, when it was set up in 97, it went to the police and said, we need access to your records. And the police, who had been disestablished by the truce at the end of the war and had been reestablished as the National Civil Police, said, oh, no, 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 we, we're good people. We have turned a page. We destroyed all our own records. No, no, no. And lied. And it wasn't until 2005 that this body of records was stumbled upon by the human rights ombudsman of uh, Guatemala. Now, we learned after that that sometime before the um, human rights ombudsman um, found these records, that the police had contacted the National Archives. And the archivist knew the records existed, never told anybody. Just went out, did the archival job, looked at it, started to decide what to take in, started to do the appraisal. I was just dumbfounded. How could you do that, knowing how important these are, knowing they were requested for uh, the Truth Commission, knowing the Truth Commission had to report out without using them, how could you treat this as just another request? Why didn't you tell anybody? They didn't. If I may add to that, actually, in answering the question of the ethical problems, I guess maybe the analogy is not quite correct, but when we had the uh, review board mm -hmm. on the, the Kennedy period, the um, AARB, uh, we faced a lot of questions. The, um, and we finally, for example, we did make the decision that privacy ends with death. And we made, we had to make curious decisions, such as <clears throat> if your name was Jones and you lived in Detroit, we release your name, your relatives would never know about it. If, however, your name was Wieserowski and you came for a town of 5,000 people, we looked the situation over and thought hard about this. So we, we really had some of these ethical problems, and um, of course many, many, many of them with the CIA. But um, you just simply have to judge. We were also appraising in some ways. And we did, we, we were forced to take a certain kind of records, the House Committee of Assassinations. And um, our executive director came in and said to us, you know, this is just about a bunch of thugs. This doesn't have anything at all to do with Kennedy assassination. Well, we had to decide what to do with those. That was after a rousing discussion of where the word thug came from. We had to, we had to enjoy ourselves once in a while. But, um, but it's tough. It really is tough. There was a man, for example, in India who apparently offered himself to the CIA in 1960 as a person living abroad who could bring uh, feedback to the CIA. 
and he was no longer employed, and he wanted a pension. Now, we were not to release names of people who were employed, but he was no longer employed. And I remember that we had, that was a very naughty personal privacy problem. The <coughs> other striking one was on one of the authors that came out of Kennedy Books in the, in the 60s. Had, the FBI began to follow him and whatever else they were doing. And so they emerged with some pictures of him in a very uh, um, exotic um, sexual situation. And um, we kept them closed. Mm -hmm. Uh, Trudy, just a last question. Uh, in these and other cases, don't these cases of violation of human rights need to be preserved simply because they are gross violations of human rights? Access is a different question. But oh, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Okay. It's 5.30. Our, I'd like to bring this to a conclusion. Roger and I feel strongly we should try and bring this to a timely end. So. I invite all of you to continue the discussion with Dr. Peterson over a glass uh, of some nibbles and uh, a little bit to drink outside. Thank you all for joining us today, and we look forward next week to Charlie Mayer. But thank you, Trudy. You're welcome.